Okay, let's start the second book of whom is Mark Polico from the University of Warwick. Uh, Mark received his PhD in Warwick University in 1984. He was a field and professor of pure mathematics in Manchester University from 1906 to 2005. Now he's uh, from 2005. He came to the uh, because, uh, become to the professor of Warwick University. Uh, Mark uh, served is uh, is serving as in many literary bodies or journals like uh, God Theory and uh, Dynamic Systems, Discrete and uh, Continuous Dynamic Systems, Journal of Fractal Geometry. Now uh, today he will speak about data functions for another force, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, let me begin by, by thanking the organizers for their uh, kindness uh, in uh, organizing this meeting and stuff. And I'd also like to thank the audience because there were a lot of parallel sessions which you could easily, there were a lot of parallel sessions you could easily go to and other entertainments and uh, I appreciate you coming here. Okay, so uh, there are two things in the uh, title I'd like to explain, uh, Zeta functions and the Nossoff flows. And so to begin, uh, let me just say something about Anosov flows. So I submitted the title a long time ago, but uh, two weeks ago uh, Anosov died, and here is a photograph of the, uh, the great man. He made a lot of very fundamental contributions to the theory of hyperbolic uh, dynamical systems. Um, I didn't know him particularly well professionally, uh, but my interaction with him consisted of the fact that he spent three weeks living in my spare room uh, in Manchester when I worked there. <coughs> And so, in particular, uh, I had to cook for him most evenings. So we had very illuminating conversations about literature, art, architecture, and he did most of the talking and I did most of the cooking. <laughs> okay, and what I want to do is to give a very a gentle introduction to uh, Zeta function. So when I was a graduate student, which was many years ago, uh, I was not that thrilled to be working on Zeta functions. They looked a bit boring. Uh, so I want to try to give a gentle introduction, which means basically it will take us maybe half of the lecture to actually get onto much dynamics. So um, you can wake up if you're uh, halfway through if you are interested <coughs> in the dynamics, but let me try to get you there. So I'll start off by talking about the Riemann Zeta function because it's the one that almost everybody has heard of and about which almost everybody knows something. And then I'll talk about the, the Selberg zeta function, which is a uh, second cousin uh, to the Riemann zeta function, uh, where instead of looking at numbers, you look at uh, something geometric, you look at lengths of closed geodesics. And then thirdly, uh, I'll try to move on to, to the Anosov flows, which are the generalization of the geodesic flow case. So there'll be three kinds of zeta functions, but in fact, the third one is just a generalization of the second one. Uh, I'll only introduce the Riemann zeta function for the purposes of motivation. I will not be proving anything fundamental or new uh, about the Riemann uh, the zeta function. And also, if, if you study dynamical systems and you're used to zeta functions, I'll only be talking about the zeta functions for flows. Um, it's quite fashionable to talk about zeta functions for discrete transformations and then prove that they're rational functions and things like this. These are a different kinds of zeta functions, so I'll only talk about zeta functions for flows, and that will be it. And there's a general philosophy which works in each of these cases, and it's probably the raison d'etre for studying zeta functions. It's that you want to know something about your system or your primes or whatever these numbers are, and the way to study them is to cook up this complex function prove something about the complex function, and deduce something about the original problem. And that's the general philosophy. And the blueprint for that comes from the study in number theory of prime numbers, and also the study of the Riemann uh, zeta function. So therefore, I'll start by talking just about number theory and the Riemann zeta function. So one of the basic problems in prime number theory is counting primes. So if you just index the prime numbers, 
in this case, 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19, 23, 29, 31, and a few more, in fact there's infinitely many, um, then you can ask, well, how many primes are there? Well, there's infinitely many, but if you want to count the number up to some particular bound, say x, then you can ask, how many prime numbers are there less than x? And of course, it's going to be certainly less than the number of, of natural numbers, because every prime is a natural number. And you can ask something about how they grow. So for example, the first, uh, between 1 and 10, there are four prime numbers. And between uh, 1 and 100, there are 25, I think. And between 1 and 1,000, there's 168, probably. I didn't check, the standard plausible. And if you carry on uh, counting them, there's infinitely many, but the number that you find between uh, 1 and x, either x is 10, 100, 1,000, or something even bigger, well, it grows like x over log x. It has a density of 1 over log x between 1 and x. And so the asymptotic formula is this. It simply means that this ratio converges to, to 1. Uh, this is a result which was proved by uh, Hadamard and, and de la Vallée Poussin, and it was proved in 19, uh, sorry, 1896. Uh, Hadamard proved it when he was in, in Bordeaux as a, as a matter de confiance, uh, and uh, he went on to get promoted after that. And uh, he went on to live to be 98. And uh, the library all say is named after him, and it has very interesting biographical details there. So it's one of the fundamental basic building blocks in, in number theory and, for example, it was mentioned in Green's talk this morning. Okay. And, the, and one of the main tools used to prove this was the famous Riemann zeta function. So it will make now an appearance. So the Riemann zeta function uh, was, in fact, introduced by Euler, hence it's called the Riemann zeta function. Uh, the picture on the left is of uh, Riemann, the picture on the right is of, of Euler. And the classical way to introduce it when I teach first year calculus, which is a course I used to teach in Martin Hera, but he's moved on to greater things, uh, is to write it as a Dirichlet series, a sum 1 over n to the s. So s is just a complex uh, variable, and not surprisingly, it converges in a half plane to the right of the real part of s is equal to 1. So this is just basic series stuff. And the contribution of Euler was that you could also write it as an infinite product. So rather than an infinite sum, you can write it as an infinite product, where instead of summing over the natural numbers, uh, you sum over the prime numbers. So these are the primes we saw before, 2, 3, 5, 7, 11. They seem to be lesser than now because I got bored writing them. Uh, but it's an infinite product, and for each of these you take the product 1 minus p to the minus s to the minus 1. And then when you multiply it out, you get exactly the same series above, at least on the domain of convergence. And so it's the same function, just represented in a different way. And the question is, well, what can you say about the properties of this complex function? And the important thing is that the more you can say about them, the more you can deduce about the primes. And so I've already said that it converges on the half plane the real part of s bigger than 1. That's rather obvious to, to see, as is illustrated in this uh, uh, clever uh, animation. And it has, a, it has a simple pole. It has a pole like 1 over s minus 1 at the point s equals 1. So it has an extension to a neighborhood of there, which is just a pole. And if you look at the line above, it has an extension to there, but this has no zeros and indeed no poles. And also, these two properties by themselves were how uh, Hadamard and the Valley Poussin managed to prove the prime number theorem. You prove something about this complex function, use a bit of analysis, maybe Cauchy's theorem, something like that, and you can get the asymptotic formula out without too much difficulty. So these properties of this complex function, information about its extension, are enough to prove just the asymptotic, which is the prime number theorem. And more is known, it's also known that the, the uh, function has an extension to the entire complex plane, which means that, in fact, it's analytic, except for this pole at uh, s equals uh, 1. Okay, so that's what's known in particular about the Riemann zeta function. And the first two properties, the properties of this complex function, are enough to tell you something useful uh, about the primes. And 
something that's not quite so well known, because it's still an open problem, uh, is the Riemann hypothesis. So we know that there's an extension of the, the complex function to the entire plane, uh, but we don't know much about the location of the zeros, at least I don't. And the Riemann uh, hypothesis is a conjecture that all the uh, non-trivial zeros lie on the line the real part of S equals uh, a, a half. And that's the statement at the bottom. And this was the, uh, the famous conjecture from Riemann's uh, article in, in 1859, and it was repeated as one of the Hilbert problems um, at the ICM in 1900. OK, so these are properties of the, the zeta function, and these might be properties if anybody knew how to, to prove them. And why would one want to, to prove the Riemann hypothesis besides getting money? Uh, well, one reason is that it leads to better estimates on the number of primes. So uh, this rather unpleasant looking formula is counting the number of primes between 1 and x. And it claims that, well, we know it grows like x over log x. But in fact, the principal term is this more analytic looking function. And then this grows like x over log x. And the error term is, is somewhat smaller. And so if you knew the Riemann hypothesis, you know more about the growth of, of prime numbers. They have this much more precise uh, asymptotic uh, formula. Okay. So here is a summary. Uh, this is a picture taken from uh, the movie A uh, Beautiful Mind. Um, on the flight here by Lufthansa, they had the Gladiator, which is a more exciting movie. Uh, but this one has the virtue that it has a whiteboard in it, and it has most of the statements I just made written in the back. Uh, probably invisible from anywhere beyond the, the, the uh, front, uh, but it has all the statements there in some disguised, uh, disguised form. Okay, so for the Riemann zeta function, we so for the for the prime numbers, we look at the Riemann zeta function. It's a complex function. And what does it tell us? Well, its properties we translate into information about the growth of uh, prime numbers. Okay, that sounds like fun. So why, why are we talking about this? Well, this is going to be the blueprint. It's going to be the motivation uh, for studying next the more geometric problem. So uh, first of all, we want to replace this sequence of numbers, that was the prime numbers, by another sequence of numbers. And geometrically, what we'll do is we'll take a, a surface or a manifold, usually with negative curvature. And I'll start off by assuming we look at a surface with constant curvature minus 1, because it makes life easier for the notation. And then what we want to do is to, is to count the number of closed geodesics whose lengths are less than some particular bound. So before, we were counting the primes, whose values were less than some value of x. And now we're going to count the prime, uh, we're going to count the closed geodesics, it's countably many, whose lengths are, are less than a uh, value uh, t. So here is a picture of a surface, here is the real line, here is t. I'm going to count the number of geodesics whose lengths are less than that. This will be very clever. Okay, so there's the first geodesic, and its length uh, is just plotted on this line, it's that point. Here's another guy. He's the next uh, shortest, so I put the point there. You keep on going, you keep looking at all the closed geodesics on the surface, uh, all the ones which are shortest in their free homotopy class, and then eventually you get to a situation that you've exhausted all the ones whose lengths are less than t, and we want to count how many that is as t increases, in the same way that we counted primes whose value was less than some particular bound. And so here's the notation. I'll let gamma denote some closed geodesic on, on my surface, which I'm assuming at the moment has, is, is compact and it has constant curvature minus 1. And, I'll, and I'll, I'll, let, I'll let it, apparently, I'll let its length just be denoted by L, L for length of the uh, geodesic. And so the counting thing will now be called uppercase pi of t. And this is a number. It's the number of, of uh, closed geodesics whose length is less than this value of t. It's a finite number for any given t. Clearly, it's monotone as t increases, and we want to know what the asymptotic is. And if you were in uh, Kurt McMullen's uh, laudation uh, on the first day, then you've already seen it. Uh, in fact, it's asymptotic to uh, e to the t over t uh, as t tends to infinity. So the number of uh, closed geodesics on the surface, ordered by, by their, their lengths, grows at quite a fast rate. It's essentially um, exponential. 
uh, but divided by t. And it's a simple formula which doesn't depend on the geometry uh, much. Uh, it's just an asymptotic uh, formula. And, and this um, result uh, was published by Huber uh, in 1959, although it, it's implicit in the work of Selberg from three years uh, earlier. Uh, Kurt attributed it to somebody in the vortex, but I'm not quite sure who that is supposed to be. And it takes the same general form as the prime number theorem, because the prime number theorem said the number of primes less than x grew like x over log x. And this says that the number of geodesics whose length is less than t grows like e to the t over t. And so if you replace x by e to the t, they look the same. And the reason is because they have similar kinds of, of, of proofs. And the way classically to prove this, this formula, due to either Kubo or, or Selberg, uh, is to use an appropriate zeta function, the zeta function replacing the Riemann zeta function, where the primes are replaced by lengths of uh, closed uh, geodesics. And this is the Selberg zeta function. And the definition you could guess, based on what we're trying to prove, uh, but you don't need to because I'm going to tell you, so uh, you take uh, a closed geodesic, and as I already said, for any closed geodesic on the surface, I'll denote its length by L of gamma, L standing for length yet again. And then a version of the Selberg zeta function uh, would be uh, the following. It's the complex function, so S is the, the complex uh, variable. It's given by an Euler product, so it's an infinite product over closed uh, geodesics. And what you take the product of is this expression involving uh, the uh, length of the geodesic. And if you replace e to the minus uh, L of gamma by 1 over the length of a prime, it looks not unlike the, uh, the Riemann zeta function. So formally it has the same expression. And of course the philosophy is that if you prove stuff about the Selberg zeta function, if it prove its properties are similar to those of the Riemann zeta function, then you can deduce similar things by the same method of proof. So formally, it's just a, a complex function motivated by the Riemann uh, zeta function. Okay. In fact, historically, the, the Selberg zeta function was not defined in this way. Uh, it was defined as an extra product over the uh, integers, uh, but the natural numbers. But in fact, I don't want to include that because this has a slightly more aesthetic form. And this definition is actually due to David Rouault. Okay, so the Selberg zeta function, we can define it. And if we can prove things about it, it will have the virtue that we can then follow the, the recipe given by the proof of the prime number theorem to say stuff about the number of, of primes. Okay, so here's a picture of uh, Selberg. And indeed, it has rather similar properties uh, to the, uh, the Riemann zeta function. It converges in the half plane uh, to the right of the value 1, so to the right of this dotted line. It has an extension which has a simple pole at the value s equals uh, 1. Uh, the significance of 1 is that I assume that the surface had curvature equal to minus 1. The 1's are no coincidence, that's why it's the 1 here. And if you look at the vertical line above that, well, the function also extends to there without any zeros or poles. And as in the case of, of the prime number theorem, that's enough to uh, prove the result. And the third result, uh, you can say, is that in, in fact this zeta function not only extends to the neighborhood of this line, but it extends to the entire complex plane. Although in this case, it's not necessarily analytic everywhere except at one. It's just a general meromorphic function. So there may be isolated poles of uh, finite multiplicity. But it's a complex function. It has some properties. And traditionally, uh, when you uh, prove uh, this result in the fifth year, say, um, the classical approach was to use the Solberg uh, trace formula, which is a kind of useful tool in analysis. And what it actually tells you is something about the locations of zeros or possibly poles uh, of the function. And they're in fact related to the uh, spectrum of the Laplace, uh, Laplacian on the surface. So without saying too much about that, it gives us information about the location of, of zeros and poles. And so in particular, it allows you to prove uh, a weak analog of the Riemann hypothesis. 
So for the Riemann zeta function, nothing much is known uh, about uh, the Riemann hypothesis. There's no strip to which we know you can extend the function uh, analytically um, uh, without uh, zeros. Um, but in the case of the um, Selberg zeta function, we know that, in fact, there is an extension beyond this line. So it converges to the right of this, this is a simple pole, and there's a strip in which there are no zeros or, or poles. And this information means that we can carry out this dream of getting error terms for numbers of um, closed geodesics that would mimic what we'd hope to do for the uh, prime numbers. And so in particular, an immediate corollary is if you count uh, the number of closed geodesics whose length is less than t, well, we already know that it's going to be asymptotic to e to the t over t. The information in the neighborhood of this line was enough to give that. But we cut extra information here, which gives us an error term for the principal term for the counting function. So this is analog. The more we know about the zeta function, the more we can say about, in this case, um, the, the distribution of weights of the uh, closed uh, geodesics. Okay. So at the bottom of the screen, on the right-hand side, it says 12 out of 30. I actually have 30 slides visible, but I'm not hoping to get through them all. I'm hoping to finish somewhere in the low 20s. Okay, so this brings us to a rather natural question. So uh, surfaces of constant curvature are really good. Um, but if you're, say, a Romanian geometer, or maybe someone interested in, in, in dynamical systems in, in it from a Romanian viewpoint, uh, you might want to replace the underlying surface, which I assume to have constant curvature, by one which had, say, variable curvature. So negative curvature is still necessary to, 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 to get some reasonable sort of analysis. But what happens if we were to consider a more general surface? So here is a picture of what you might think of as being the uh, original surface of constant curvature minus one, and we can try to perturb the, the metric in some region, which apparently has to be pink. At least it's pink when I, when I drew it. It looks to be a kind of um, whitish color. So you could change the metric inside there by just making some sort of bump, and providing it's still negatively curved, it would still be a surface to which you can ask exactly the same question about the distributions of of, of uh, closed uh, geodesics. Okay. Unfortunately, the original approach, the, the Selberg trace formula, no longer applies in this case, and so one has to use something completely different, and the good news is that means that we can introduce some dynamical uh, ideas. Okay. So in particular, the dynamical viewpoint is to look at the geodesic flow uh, associated to the uh, negatively curved uh, surface. So, here is a picture again of the same surface, and I'm going to look at, uh, I'll call it V, and I want to assume just that it's got possibly variable, but certainly negative curvature, and that it's compact, and I want to define the geodesic flow. So the geodesic flow is defined not on the uh, surface, but on the unit tangent bundle. So for every point, I have to consider a vector of unit length, and since I have a surface, uh, the unit uh, length vectors will be a three-dimensional space. And then I want to consider the flow. So the flow will move one of these guys to another guy. And the game is that, given your initial condition, the point and the direction, uh, you look at some geodesic. Well, you choose the geodesic, which goes to the point x at time zero in this particular direction. And you flow for time t. You want to, you want to define a flow for time t, and what we do is we just push the uh, unit tangent vector to be parallel transported along the curve up until time t. So it gives us a well-defined uh, dynamical system associated to the original geometric uh, problem. And this is a well-defined C infinity uh, flow, and if we were particularly lucky, which is that if the point x lay on a closed geodesic and v was tangent to it, then, in fact, we go around and come back to the same place. So, in fact, the closed geodesics uh, correspond to closed orbits for the geodesic flow. And the length of the closed geodesic corresponds to the period, the least period, uh, of the orbit. So, it translates this purely geometric problem into a very simple dynamical problem where instead of looking at lengths of, of geodesics, 
closed geodesics. assets. We're now looking at uh, lane, uh, least periods of closed orbits for some flow. So here's a, a kind of small uh, historical uh, aside. So I mentioned that Hadamard was one of the people that proved the prime number theorem in 1896. Well, in fact, two years later, he wrote a, a rather fundamental paper on geodesic flows on negatively curved uh, surfaces. It's a picture of Hadamard again, probably the same picture. And uh, this paper did not get much recognition, but it was popularized uh, some years later, eight years later, in a book by a French physicist, uh, which was subsequently translated into German by uh, Friedrich Adler, a picture of Adler at the top. And uh, in 1909, Adler uh, shared a house with Albert Einstein, and uh, there was some speculation about whether or not the ideas of uh, Hadamard uh, were uh, influential in Einstein's work. But the more interesting thing is that Adler was also the person that assassinated the Prime Minister of Austria uh, in 1916 in the middle of the uh, First World War. Okay, so uh, now I want to move on to the, the second part of the uh, title, and so uh, I want to look at uh, flows which are not off. So the geodesic flows I've already defined have this property, the property being that they're in loss of. So we were looking at the geodesic flow on a uh, surface, so that meant that it was a flow in a three-dimensional manifold of unit tension vectors. And so uh, this three-dimensional space has the loss of property, which is that if you flow in this picture horizontally, then transverse to that, it has a property that in one direction it expands and the other it contracts. So if I start over here, and I move in this direction, the orbit has a property that nearby vectors contract in this direction and they expand uh, in, in another direction. So this is the, the famous uh, Anosov uh, property. And I forgot what was on the slide. Okay, and so the important thing here is that the, the flows I've been looking at, the geodesic flows, are a special case uh, more generally uh, of uh, an Anosov flow. An extra property uh, which they have is that if you look at the lengths of the closed uh, geodesics, they can't all be multiples of the same value. They can't all, for example, just be natural numbers. And so this is an extra useful property uh, for the flow. So we're looking at geodesic flows, and uh, they are special cases of a more general uh, loss of flow. OK, this is the same notation, uh, except now I'm going to say that we look at a closed orbit, it might come from a closed geodesic in the case of a geodesic flow, and I'll denote its uh, length by lambda of tau. And then I want to count the number of closed uh, orbits for the flow whose length is less than t. And I'll denote that by pi of t. So in the case of a geodesic flow, it would correspond precisely to the question of counting uh, closed geodesics on the uh, surface. Uh, I, need, I, I need some sort of normalization somewhere, and so the correct thing to introduce is a topological entropy for the geodesic flow. This is the same as the topological entropy of the time one now. Okay, with this notation, we have the following uh, generalization of the result of Huber and um, Selberg, and this is the, the prime orbit theorem, which is essentially due to uh, Margulis uh, from uh, 1969. And it says basically the same as the previous results uh, in this more general setting of uh, weak mixing and loss of flows, which includes geodesic flows on negatively curved uh, manifolds. Then there's the asymptotic for the counting of the number of uh, prime uh, closed geodesics, uh, the geodesics, uh, sorry, closed orbits whose length is less than t grows like e to the h times t divided by h times t. So if h was equal to 1, it would be precisely the same asymptotic as before, e to the t uh, over t. So the original proof of, of uh, Margulis does not use um, anything to do with uh, zeta functions. It uses uh, the Margulis measure and the construction of measuring maximal entropy from transverse measures for horocycle uh, foliations, but it could have used zeta functions. And if it did, it would have used uh, this zeta function. So this is just the natural generalization of what I stated to be the uh, Selberg zeta function, where in this particular case, uh, one is defining a complex function in now what is the time-honored way 
of taking a product, in this case over countably many closed orbits, and it's, a pro it's an Euler product which involves here the lengths of each of the closed orbits. So it's easy to guess what most of these definitions will be, and you're probably guessing correctly. And it, con it, it converges in a certain half plane, and in this case the half plane is to the right of the value h of phi, that is the topological entropy for the original flow. So it's a generalization of the Selberg uh, zeta function um, due to the Ruel, whose picture adorns this um, piece of paper. Okay. And as it says at the bottom, if in, in a special case that our Nossel flow is a geodesic flow on the negatively curved manifold, then it just reduces to the Selberg uh, <coughs> zeta function. Okay. Uh, here, here is a comment about using this zeta function to prove the, uh, the, um, the prime orbit theorem, the theorem of Margulis. Uh, so if you wanted to show that it was true using the Riemann zeta function, then it requires the same properties. You need that the zeta function has a simple pole at s equals h, and uh, you have to show that it has uh, a nice analytic uh, non-zero extension to a, uh, the line above the value s equals h. And uh, these properties were proved a long time ago. Uh, this is a picture of, of me uh, in 1982, which we're going to do this result. Notice the similarity. Uh, <laughs> and the first part of this theorem uh, was actually proved by Ruel some years earlier. And uh, it actually appears as an exercise in his book from 1978 called Thermodynamic Formalism. Uh, available through Cambridge University Press at the moment. Uh, unfortunately, this exercise is kind of tough, and we couldn't solve it. Uh, so we wrote to uh, Ruel asking him how to do his exercise, and he wrote up an article in the notices of the AMS describing this. And the gist of it was he couldn't do the exercise either for some time, and he worked through it, and then eventually uh, he managed to solve it. <coughs> but then he received a letter from my supervisor Parry uh, saying he needn't bother. Uh, because uh, we'd actually discovered how to do the exercise. Uh, but in fact, Ruel didn't know that in fact our solution was wrong, and so in fact we used his solution after all. Uh, okay, so the, 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 the other thing I wanted to talk about uh, was the third property. So if I go back to these properties of the, uh, the, the uh, zeta function, so this describes uh, how you can extend it, first of all, in the neighborhood of, of the entropy uh, with a simple pole, and, in fact, you can extend it all along that line, elsewhere being non-zero and, and analytic. And the third property, uh, which was a bit elusive at the time, uh, was to try to extend the zeta function to, the, in some form or other, to the entire complex plane. And so, uh, some 30-ish uh, uh, years uh, later, uh, there's now a statement that says this is true. So this is a, a statement involving these two Italian gentlemen and myself. Uh, which basically says that the zeta function of, uh, of Ruel actually has an extension which, which goes not only from the half plane to a neighborhood of the line, the real part of S equals H, but it has an analytic extension, a merimorph, sorry, meromorphic extension to the entire uh, complex uh, plane. And the proof uh, is based on using uh, an argument to do with certain linear operators. Uh, not, not Laplace Beltrami operators, these are bounded linear operators, are acting on spaces of, of distributions. And there are other proofs available now for this. And as a corollary, you recover the results of, of, um, of uh, Selberg because, of course, if we took the, the surface, uh, the surface of constant negative curvature, then what would happen is that the associated geodesic flow is a loss of, so therefore this result applies. But, the result also applies in the case where we have a, a compact manifold with uh, a variable negative sectional curvatures, for example, uh, a compact surface with negative uh, Gaussian uh, curvature, and then the aforementioned zeta function, Selberg or Ruel, has a property that it extends to the entire uh, complex uh, plane. Um, this could be a slightly irksome result because then you're left with the question of trying to describe uh, what these values uh, are. Uh, but this is an area which uh, has uh, benefited uh, from 
a lot of uh, attention from very smart people. Uh, I tried to list uh, everyone who I thought might be in the audience and was in the area. If I've missed anyone out, then I apologize. Um, and the reason that, that the first two properties of the zeta function were proved in the 80s was basically because the tools back then were to use symbolic dynamics and to reduce the problem to looking at subshifts of finite time and some associated uh, analysis based on the work of people like uh, Ruel and uh, Bowen and uh, Sinai. And uh, the reason that now it's possible to prove results on extending to the entire plane uh, are because there's a more modern approach nowadays where one looks at simpler uh, operators but somewhat more sophisticated uh, Banach spaces, uh, which were eloquently uh, described in the uh, talk of Sushi last week. And this uh, rather blurred picture at the bottom is a photograph of um, Suji's slide, which you can't really see, from his talk um, last week. Okay, so I have no idea what's on the next slide. It would be exciting to find out. Oh yeah, so um, I mentioned uh, that there were, there were several stages in, in studying these zeta functions. And so I mentioned that the, the Riemann hypothesis is kind of elusive in the case of, of, of the Riemann zeta function. Uh, in the case of constant curvature uh, surfaces, um, it's, there is a sort of version of that. You get an extension which is non-zero and analytic to a strip, apart from one pole. And there's actually a partial analogue uh, sometimes uh, in the case of variable curvature. But you have to make some sort of assumptions. And so in this case, if we have a manifold, for example, which is d-dimensional, and it's got negative sectional curvatures, and again, I'm using H to represent the, the entropy of the uh, flow. Then what happens is that we get a sort of weak analog um, of the uh, Riemann uh, hypothesis in as much that there's, there's a non-zero analytic extension to a small strip of, say, width uh, epsilon. I have no idea what epsilon is in general. Uh, Suji has techniques which are much better for analyzing uh, this problem. Uh, except for the simple pole at S equals 1. But there is a hypothesis we need to make which is that it should be not too far from constant uh, curvature. And not too far in this case just means that the bounds between the lower and upper uh, sectional curvatures uh, should have a ratio which is not worse than one ninth for technical reasons. And then as a corollary to this, you get that uh, if you have a, a compact manifold with negative sectional curvatures, then you can generalize the, the asymptotic result uh, from the case of constant curvature and under the same hypothesis which is that it's not too far from constant curvature in a quantifiable sense you get that the number of, of closed uh, orbits uh, closed geodesics in this case uh, which is less than t has the same um, principal asymptotic uh, term and an exponential error so in the case of manifolds of arbitrary dimension, you can prove this uh, result. And in the case of two dimensions, in fact, you don't need to make any assumption other than negative curvature. And this follows from uh, old results of uh, Dogger Piat from 1997. Anybody idea how much time there is left? Seven minutes. Seven minutes, okay. I think, unfortunately, uh, oh, so the big question, of course, is do we know it's true for any manifold with neg just negative sectional curvatures about any of the hypothesis? And the answer is, I don't know, but it might be. Okay. Or is it true for, for general weak mixing and also flows? This I do not know either. Okay, so uh, unfortunately, uh, I haven't used the time up for slowly enough, so I have to talk about some applications. So let me talk about my favorite application of zeta functions, which is to Hausdorff dimension. Um, so uh, this is a, uh, imagine that we have a, uh, an, ex uh, an expanding map which is conformal and I'll assume that it's real analytic. And so let me just uh, draw this picture. So here is uh, an example which was also shown uh, this morning. Uh, this is a, a picture of a duody uh, rabbit. And more generally if we have a transformation like a hyperbolic Julia set, uh, a rational map on a hyperbolic Julia set, then it will satisfy these hypotheses. So a, a, a real analytic conformal expanding map of some set to itself. Then you can cook up a definition of a zeta function, 
So the definition is the one I've given. You, you look at all the uh, natural numbers which correspond to periods in this value. Uh, this n uh, here should not be present. It's just 1 over n. Then you look at all the periodic points of period n, which is the thing that I'm, I'm summing uh, here. And then you look at the, the weight around the closed orbit given by the derivative of the map raised to the power s. So s here is the complex variable. So this is defined an analogy with the zeta functions I looked at earlier, but it's a zeta function, and we know that because it has an s here. So it's a complex function. And this particular zeta function has a property that it has a pole at a value s, uh, which corresponds to the Hausdorff dimension of the, the setting question. And this is a picture of uh, the grave of uh, Hausdorff, which uh, I visited, uh, I think, last month, and this is that it needs cleaning. Uh, if you know the director of the Hausdorff Institute, you could mention it to him. Okay, so if you wanted to compute the Hausdorff dimension of some particular uh, fractal like this, you might think that, that you could do it using this expression. It doesn't look particularly nice, but the thing about the zeta function is that it's actually very quick to compute. Uh, these things are very, very rapidly convergent. And so in particular, um, using ideas of Ruel and Grof and Deke and some other guys, uh, one can show that, in fact, you can compute, you can estimate the zeta function very quickly by a knowledge of only periodic points up to some small number of periods. And let me illustrate that. So, uh, in the previous talk, um, there was talk about numbers uh, whose other capital set of values whose numbers had um, continuing fraction expansion, uh, expansions with digits one, two, three, or four, but if you consider the, the Cantor set which has expansions with digits only one or two, um, then it corresponds to an example as above, because when you look at the Gauss map restricted to that set, it's real analytic and it's expanding. And if you look at the number of periodic points, which of course just correspond to quadratic thirds, uh, then up to period n equals 16, then in fact you can compute the household dimension to, uh, in this case, 25 decimal uh, places. And generally, uh, every time you um, increase this by a small amount, then it almost doubles the length of the approximation. So this is just one application of uh, dynamical zeta functions to problems uh, beyond just counting the, the, the period numbers. And so at the top of the page it says exponential decay of correlations which will be the second application, uh, but I think, in fact, I will probably stop here. Thank you. No, not, not usable, oh, sorry. <clears throat> so, not using this particular definition of, of the, uh, the zeta function. The reason is because uh, the Riemann zeta function is rather particular. It has a simple pole, and apart from that, it turns out that it's, it's analytic. So it's got one pole. Uh, whereas these dynamically defined zeta functions tend to have more poles. So, uh, there is slightly different flavor. They, they're very similar in the neighborhood of the of, of the line, the real part of S equals 1, or H. But apart from that, they have rather different properties. Do we make sense to consider zeta function in non-compact set? It's very nice volume, like on modular surface, or some arithmetic surfaces, non-compact uh, Yeah, so if you, if you want to look at the non-compact case, uh, so well, in constant curvature, uh, indeed, people do do that. Um, the the Selberg uh, technique works quite well. Uh, in, in that setting, uh, apart from some, some slight hiccups. Uh, I didn't mention it particularly because uh, more traditional symbolic approaches, or the approach I was talking about, does not generalize so well to the non-compact setting. Constructing these Banach spaces is a bit more complicated. Um, if you go for variable curvature, and you wanted to prove results for um, counting closed geodesics and zeta functions in that case, then, of course, if, you, if you're in a, in a non-compact case, you need some sort of control on the curvature and the cusps. So if you assume enough, then I think you can deduce things. 
but the techniques, I mean, we're not at that situation yet, but in principle it could be done. More questions, comments? Mm -hmm. No, we we'll speak again.